Hey you. Yeah, you. Listen well, because I'm only gonna say this once. Gotham Knights is good. And I will die on this hill! After a bunch of delays, cryptic images, and a shit ton of skepticism, Gotham Knights is here. Developed by WB Montreal, which you guys know, they've had a prominent hand in previous Batman games, developing Arkham Origins, Arkham City Armored Edition, as well as being involved in DLC for Arkham Knight. They make a good candidate for the next Batman related thing. And Patrick Redding having the lead as creative director with notable works like Far Cry 2, which has an impressive, dynamic open world. Splinter Cell Blacklist, which lets you play as a badass dude with expensive gadgets, you know, fits the bill. However, Gotham Knights has had one of the most convoluted development cycles I've witnessed in real time. The first seed of this game being planted at the end of Arkham Origins with the uh, post credit scene teasing the, the next game as a Suicide Squad related thing, which I guess did go on to be Rocksteady's upcoming Suicide Squad game. Is there a link there? I, I guess so. Then, I, uh, train, hold on, train. Living in New York City, everyone. So yeah, so it was gonna be a Damian Wayne game, but I also think it was gonna be a Batman Beyond game. So I guess it's like a new interpretation of having Damian Wayne be, be the Batman Beyond. But anyway, what we landed on was Gotham Knights, a game featuring the Bat Family, Nightwing, Robin, Red Hood, and Batgirl. These guys have been featured in previous Arkham games, but they were more of a supporting cast rather than being the leading superheroes we play as. And when it was announced that we were gonna be able to play as this ragtag crew of handsome young adults in a multiplayer, co-op, action, loop-based game, it was met with a lot of groans. I, I guess we haven't recovered from the last time. Which, fair enough, fair enough, that was a disaster. Rest in peace, Marvel's Avengers, you will not be forgotten. But, like my boy, the Arkham Knight, yeah, yeah, we remember, Jason, uh, like he said at the top of this video, I'm here to tell you that I like Gotham Knights. I, I like it a lot. That's not to say that I don't recognize the problems this game has. It has a lot of them, and I will absolutely get into them in this video. Package, hold on. Oh, Amazon delivery guy. Where was I? To point out the elephant in the room, despite being made by a studio that previously worked on Arkham games, and despite the opening of this game heavily resembling how Arkham Knight ended, this is not an Arkham game. And I think there needs to be a middle ground when comparing this new game to the Arkham ones. I know it's almost second nature to treat the Arkham games as a touchstone, especially when the new game is inferior in almost, if not almost, every aspect. I don't think every element should be automatically stacked up against its Arkham predecessors because some of these mechanics are meant to be treated as something completely new and different and not an evolution of a previous one. Most notably... I'll say it, I think it's time we move on from free flow combat, at least for Batman games. Don't get me wrong, there's no denying the masterpiece that was the combat system from the Arkham games. At the time, I had never experienced anything like it. I don't need to get into why it's so great. But Batman games should not be defined by free flow combat. Much like how the character himself is very versatile and can be interpreted in many different ways across mediums, there are many ways to interpret martial arts mastery. And I'm glad that WB didn't fall back on something familiar and safe. However, what they did decide to go with is not groundbreaking and something we've seen a lot of in video games lately. It's in Avengers, Destiny, The Division. It's a video game as combat system. One that likes to flash numbers at you. One that keeps you waiting for your big fancy special attack to fill up. One that likes to have big obvious graphic elements displaying AoE attacks and incoming charges from brute-like enemies. It's a combat system that's not at all concerned with immersing the player as The Last of Us or Demon Souls would do. It's a math equation rather than a dance. If the enemy has X, then I should have Y. 
These elements are something that I always thought were more appropriate for fantasy games, more specifically MMORPGs. But now that just about every video game can be considered an RPG to an extent, these elements tend to bleed over into games you would imagine to be a standard action one. And with that comes things like armor, crafting components, and mod chips to put in your gear. The whole min-maxing game. I'll be the first to say that I'm not the biggest fan of this. Small brain. I just want something that feels good over staring at a menu and reading percentages and fractions and ugh. But things worked out simply here. If I saw a new thing that had a bigger number than the thing I have on now, then I would put on that new thing. And guess what? Things turned out okay. But when I did take a minute to put some thought into my gear, I completely schooled some enemies. Like the time I fought Clayface. I thought to myself, hey, doesn't heat harden clay? And wouldn't you know it, I was onto something. Let's look at it this way. This is not completely out of place in a Batman game. Batman related game. This is what Batman would do when we ask what would Batman do if he had prep time? He would study enemy weaknesses and put together the best possible gear to combat that enemy. 10 out of 10 makes you feel like Batman. I just made that joke in 2023. Subscribe. But what about the moment to moment combat? The first mistake you're gonna make when playing Gotham Knights is trying to play it like an Arkham game. You're gonna mash the attack button and be treated to sluggish, awkward, and clunky feeling combat. You also won't do a whole lot of damage, which would make fights against large groups of enemies drag on forever. But if you play the way the game intends you to, it makes a world of a difference. By utilizing the time strikes mechanic, not only will you do more damage, you'll also build your momentum meter much faster, which is what lets you use those extra powerful abilities and makes quick work of enemies while looking cool as Victor Freeze. I like that the combat system here encourages you to get better at nailing those timed strikes, as well as those perfect dodges that also contribute to your momentum meter. Once I got into that flow of striking, dodging, using environmental hazards to my advantage, and executing momentum abilities at just the right time, I was locked in and having a good time. However, nailing those time strikes can be pretty tricky when you're lost in the chaos of a big battle. They're represented by a very brief gold glint, and if you don't execute your next attack right at that very second it's there, you've missed your opportunity. Whenever I would spend a few days away from Gotham Knights and came back to it, I found myself stumbling and bumbling around with this combat system for a bit before getting back to a rhythm that let me take out enemies quickly and efficiently. I overused the dodge ability which heavily impeded the flow of enemy encounters and makes combat look worse than it actually is. Gotham Knights may not have the most accessible combat system, but once it clicks in, I think it's a lot better than people give it credit for. And again, I think WB should be commended for not falling back on the safe option. One of the biggest challenges an action game that features multiple playable characters can face is making each one feel unique. Especially in superhero games, where characters are often defined by their distinct abilities or fighting styles. I think Gotham Knights succeeds in this regard. Not only does each member of the Bat family have momentum abilities that are vastly different from one another, but also their general approach to combat is unique and appropriate for their character. Don't make a dick joke, don't make a dick joke, don't make a dick joke, don't make a dick joke! Dick. <laughs> Nightwing has an emphasis on acrobatic attacks that have him ambushing enemies from above, as well as abilities that provide buffs to co-op partners, playing into the theme of him replacing Batman as the leader. Robin uses his tech savviness to apply elemental properties to his attacks. Red Hood feels the most different from the bunch, which I think is appropriate since he's the black sheep of the family. His combat mainly revolves around his dual pistols. So much so that where everyone else's time strikes depend on when you execute your next melee attack, for Red Hood, a successful time strike comes from a well-timed pull of the trigger. He also feels the most aggressive out of the characters, being able to grapple enemies a lot easier and applying a fear debuff to enemies surrounding him. To me, Barbara felt like the most well-rounded character, having a bit of everything. She can get up close and personal with aggressive attacks, can handle crowd control, and is well equipped for stealth scenarios with her ability to be undetectable by security cameras and the like. Her kind of prepared for anything build made her feel like the most direct successor to the Batman. I loved how different each character felt from one another and how varied their abilities were. However, one thing that drastically holds back Gotham Knights combat as well as other major aspects is its progression system. If I had to change just one thing about this game, it would be this. 
They made some baffling decisions that hamper the pace in which you unlock new abilities. By the time I rolled credits on this game, I still had a handful of momentum abilities to unlock for each character that would have made combat more varied and enjoyable. Sometimes unlocking new abilities are tied to completing very specific tasks, like defeating a certain number of a specific enemy type or defeating X number of enemies with a specific attack. If you're not tracking these tasks, they can easily be overlooked, and it'll make you miss out on attacks that would expand combat options. But the worst part of this is that progress for these side tasks are not shared across the Bat family, meaning that if I decided to main Nightwing for 80% of the game, but decided that I wanted to use Batgirl toward the end of the game, most of her abilities would still be locked because I haven't been doing a whole lot with her. Luckily, I kept the balanced rotation of switching between these characters every few missions, but even with that, I clocked in at around 38 hours by the time I reached the end of the game and still didn't have all their momentum abilities unlocked. This game banks on the idea that you'll be spending a lot of time completing these mundane tasks of stopping the same recycled crimes for hours upon hours to unlock more moves. Open world superhero games have been doing this since 2004, but it would normally be for the one superhero you're playing as. When you're asked to do this for four different heroes, if you attempt to play like I did, it hurts the pace of the game. This doesn't only affect combat abilities, this design flaw strikes at what I think is the Achilles heel of Gotham Knights. A big worry I heard many people online express was that Gotham Knights will easily fall into the games as a service gameplay loop. To bring up the obvious example, Marvel's Avengers. At its core, Marvel's Avengers is about that grind to get better gear that continues even after the credits roll. Gotham Knights is not about that. There are elements that may remind you of games as a service tropes, like the recycled crimes that mirror daily objective, we've got chests, and well, just look at this menu. But Gotham Knights is not at all a games as a service. It's closer to something like Borderlands or Far Cry. A standard open world game with story missions, side missions, random events, and collectibles. It's the biggest open world map we've had in a Batman game. It's split into different districts, each having their own aesthetic. You can find historic landmarks in old Gotham, like ancient cathedrals. Downtown Gotham illuminates the night sky with bright neon signs. North Gotham is more residential and offers local attractions like Robinson Park and the Planetarium. There are many things to do in Gotham City, but exploring the open world map and going on your nightly patrols are hindered by poorly designed traversal systems. Gotham Knight's poor traversal systems is a strong ripple that affects the overall experience because so much of your time with this game consists of getting around Gotham. Going to crimes, going to story missions, going to collectibles, races, everything. Thankfully, there's a fast travel system that can get you to many different points throughout the city. Well, guess what? You still gotta travel to those locations and scan some drones to unlock them as fast travel points. This is what I mean when I say this aspect of Gotham Knights is its Achilles heel. It's a core pillar that crumbles and almost collapses the entire establishment that is Gotham Knights. I say almost because remember, Gotham Knights is good actually. Oh, and the Bat Cycle sucks. Slowest, stiffest ride I've ever been on. I was convinced that the folks at WB would swiftly patch this bizarre decision to lock away each of the Gotham Knights traversal abilities behind such an extensive questline that, again, you have to complete for each of them. It took me hours to complete the Knighthood questline that grants you these traversal abilities. Nightwing's Fortnite Glider, Red Hood's Soul Jumps, Robin's Teleportation Device, Batgirl's ability to use her cape to glide? These are things that should be given to me after completing a short tutorial in the first moments of the game, especially if it's a superhero game. I've said this many times before, but engaging traversal mechanics is a pillar for superhero games. A distinct, iconic, memorable fighting style is a core element of superheroes, and their mode of transportation is right up there for me. Using your grappling hook to awkwardly zip around as you make your way across to the other side of the city doesn't feel like the intended way to get around. It's like if a Spider-Man game only let you wall run for the first 3-4 to four hours of the game. Gotham Knights dropped the ball from a 30-story building when it comes to this aspect. Because not only will it take you forever to unlock all of these, but once you do, you'll realize that it just wasn't worth it. All of these abilities are slow, awkward, and lack any sense of momentum. They feel so static. The worst one has to be Robin's teleportation device. This thing literally brings the game's pace to a screeching halt. All it is is slowly dragging a cursor to where you want to teleport. 
it's faster to just keep zipping around. This is probably why these abilities are optional to begin with. That's blasphemous. These mechanics deserve to be as fleshed out and integral to the game as combat, story, and level design are. Doubly so when we're talking about an open world game. It's no wonder why these traversal abilities are disabled during story missions. Again, they're optional, almost an afterthought. Sure, most of the time it doesn't make sense to even use a Fortnite glider in a tight indoor setting, but late in the game there's a mission that presents you with a platforming section that the Fortnite glider would deem obsolete. I would easily be able to Fortnite glide my way across these chasms. But like I said, the game disables these abilities for the sake of forcing you to use your grapple hook for this section and traverse it the way the designers want you to. There's no diegetic reasoning, so you just have to awkwardly ignore the fact that this highly trained, super brained Batman protege just doesn't want to use his Fortnite glider. While Gotham Knight's open world element is hindered by its less than stellar traversal mechanics, its indoor and more linear segments were the highlights for me. They were well paced and had a good balance of stealth, action, puzzles, and exploration that kept things fresh. I was a big fan of the detective sections where you have to link pieces of evidence together to solve a crime. It felt more hands-on to me than the previous detective sections from the Arkham games. I do wish they got more difficult as the game went on, but I don't think I was stumped by a single one. Spoilers! Batman dies in the beginning of Gotham Knights, but then spoilers, he's resurrected because what'd you expect? But spoilers, he dies again. For real this time. Spoilers. Look, I know everyone and their mom saw this coming from a mile away and bashed this game for going for such an obvious twist, but I think that's unfair. I didn't go into this game ready to judge the quality of its story solely on whether they decided to keep Batman dead or not. Killing him off is an obvious story premise that forces his adoptive children to step up to the plate. Yes, he could have been off-world, badly injured, or being held hostage. But, you know comics, gotta raise the stakes somehow. Besides, no one ever stays dead. The main plot deals with our heroes uncovering the myth of the Court of Owls, and which political powers from Gotham City are involved with them. I've read the Court of Owls story arc from the comics, and I thought these new adversaries were cool and different for the Dark Knight to face at the time, but I never really cared that much for them. Gotham Knights does a good job of having their own spin on the mystery that kept me entertained all the while being pretty predictable. But introducing the Court of Owls, one of, if not Batman's most formidable band of freakos, in a game where his former sidekicks no longer have their mentor to seek out guidance from, is a daunting element that puts these characters to the test. But even with that, I'm more interested in seeing how the Gotham Knights handle this death in the family. How they come together to take on this insurmountable task of continuing Batman's legacy. At this point in their lives, these characters each had a very different relationship with Bruce. Seeing the nuances of their reactions to his passing, whether he stays dead or not, is enough to have me on board. The gravitas of this story is also the perfect opportunity to bring these characters to a wider audience. Not to say that more casual audiences have been completely unaware of them, but when this Batman related game was announced, it was greeted with a lot of, ugh, I'd rather just play as Batman. It's not easy sharing the spotlight with the Cape Crusader. So I was hoping that Gotham Knights would do what Into the Spider-Verse did for Miles Morales. Successes like that movie and the Miles Morales video game have propelled the character to levels of popularity that even your mom knows who he is. Yes, everyone knows who Robin and Batgirl are, but do they know Dick, Barbara, Tim, and Jason? Who they evolved into and who they are in comics today? That's what I wanted this game to do for these characters. Or something even better, a new and different interpretation that resonates with modern audiences. Again, like Into the Spider-Verse did for Miles. Sadly, this game was not the one to do it for them. By the time credits rolled, these characters did not feel like genuine, relatable people that I cared for. They fell into generic character archetypes that we've seen many times before. The angry one, the young one, the reluctant leader, the one that doesn't really stick out. Sometimes it's the performances, sometimes it's the disingenuous moments of humor or forced camaraderie. They feel like cardboard cutouts of the icons they should be bolstering. There are moments where something is cooking. Emotions are bubbling inside me when these characters are grieving for lost loved ones or are terrified at the uncertainty of the path that lies ahead. They're being vulnerable with people they love and trust, but as soon as things start getting tender and sappy, 
the cutscene fades to black. I wish the game would dwell on these moments and let them play out. They should be the heart of the game. Instead, they feel like vignettes that are checking off a list out of obligation. It doesn't feel naturally played out. It doesn't help that these moments are few and far between throughout the campaign and are optional. Some have to be unlocked by doing side quests and you have to trigger them by walking up to a waypoint. Because of this, there's no natural progression to these characters' grief. That undersells the premise of this story. You can play for hours and hours without the game delving into these characters' psyche. Or you can scrunch all these moments together and feel like you got hit with a shotgun blast of artificial melodrama. The most awkward moment I had with this more freeform manner of storytelling was when I completed each of the Gotham Knights knighthood questline. When I turned it in, I was treated to a touching moment between Jason and Alfred. Once the cutscene ended, I switched over to Tim to turn in his quest and noticed that his cutscene was suspiciously similar to Jason's. You can see where this is going. Alfred's dialogue is the same in every version of this cutscene. It's neutral enough that it fits whatever Tim, Dick, Jason, and Barbara say in their version of this scene. It took me so far out of the experience. It reminded me that this is just a character model with polygons, textures, and pre-recorded lines of dialogue. You're not Alfred, you're a robot! The nature of open world games often won't allow a story to be told in a meticulous manner, but newer games have had innovative ways of hitting key story beats that will even interrupt the flow of open world exploration for the sake of delivering that plot point with no remorse. I needed that kind of philosophy applied to Gotham Knights. I do appreciate that the team at WB allowed you to play as any member of the Bat family at any given moment, and that each of them have different dialogue for every cutscene that is reflective of their personalities. I feared that they would come off as too neutral or be silent for the sake of fitting any character the player chooses for the given story beat. But whatever Red Hood would say in a cutscene sounded like something only he would say, and so on. The team here is doing four times the work it would otherwise take had they chosen to go the Marvel's Avengers route and had Nightwing only missions or Batgirl only missions. I started crafting my own headcanon to justify why I picked a certain character for certain missions. I picked Jason for Harley Quinn missions because maybe there was a possibility of getting some closure for the most tragic moment in his life through the person closest to the one responsible for it. I picked Tim Drake for Mr. Freeze missions because Maybe he can finally bring the doctor's chilling rampage to an end, proving to himself that he can still serve his duty without a Batman. While we're on the topic of the rogues gallery, let's talk about how they're implemented into the story. Well, they're kinda not. Except for Penguin, he plays a significant role in the central plot. I really like the direction they went with him, he's trying to go straight after a long life of crime. But everyone else is in their own bubble that doesn't affect the greater narrative. And I kinda like that. The whole deal with the Court of Owls taking over Gotham and having this underground secret century-long agenda with the conflict against the League of Assassins, it's, it's a lot on the plate. I like that I can follow a self-contained side story involving Clayface and check out from the main story. That being said, it would have been nice if these case files offered a new and intriguing direction for these villains. Mr. Freeze wants to cover the city in ice, Harley is crazy, Clayface is angry. Okay, that may sound like an oversimplification, but also not really. There is a bit of backstory to set up each of the villains' motivation, but we don't get to see that. We just read about it, and they're easily the most interesting parts. When Batman was alive, he promised Mr. Freeze that he would help cure Nora. They managed to do that, but when Nora found out about Mr. Freeze's extensive career of crime and villainy, she turned her back on him. Nora being the sole purpose of everything he's done, this brought Freeze into a frenzy. And that's where we pick up the story as the Gotham Knights, when Freeze has already had his downfall and is essentially a Saturday morning cartoon villain who wants to share his bitter pain with the world. I think it would have been more interesting if we did get to play the parts where we help Mr. Freeze cure Nora. We carry out missions where we gather the necessary tech and research, and then we witness firsthand Nora rejecting Freeze after devoting his life to her and the side quest ends with a boss fight against a man at his lowest and most dangerous point. Yeah, it's very predictable, but better than following a side mission that's essentially about, yeah, he's pissed about something Batman had a hand in. And again, the same can be said about Clayface's side mission. 
On the other hand, there are some text files, emails, and audio logs that do an excellent job of fleshing out this world. Michael Antonakos, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, gives a worthy performance as Bruce Wayne in these audio logs, where we get some insight into Bruce's early days as the Batman, as well as him dealing with the death of Jason Todd. My favorite ones by far are the emails sent by the various heroes of the DC Universe. I absolutely fanboyed at the sight of an email from Clark Kent reaching out to the Bat family. There are many more emails here from members of the Teen Titans, Wonder Woman, and emails that the Gotham Knights sent to each other that are wholesome and made me laugh out loud. This type of content can often go overlooked in video games, but this time it absolutely deserves your attention. But what about the impact that comes from the death of Bruce Wayne? On the surface level, I commend the game for sticking to its guns and committing to keeping Bruce Wayne dead at the end of it all. Each ending with a member of the Bat family has a heartfelt moment that's emblematic of their relationship with Bruce. Even though we didn't get to spend much time with this particular version of Bruce Wayne, his send-off still felt earned and poignant to me. I took this Bruce Wayne as a distilled version of the character. The long history of comics, animated shows, movies, and other games served as context for what this moment means. The scene that follows it with whatever Gotham Knight you decided to beat the game with gives our heroes their due of becoming these symbols that continues Batman's legacy in a way that instills hope despite losing their greatest guardian. I promise I will fight for you until my final breath. Gotham Knights is not a bad game. It's good, actually. WB just stretched out a bunch of aspects that didn't need to be in the first place, mainly in regards to progression and traversal mechanics. And that ended up giving the game a long, drawn-out pace with underwhelming rewards. Maybe the game was initially meant to be a games-as-a-service, and the negative reception to Marvel's Avengers forced the team to do some hectic patchwork, and it ended up giving the game a shoddy sense of direction. But what we ended up with resembles what I wanted from this game anyway. You know, a, a game with a cohesive narrative, uh, tight linear story missions with enough variety to keep things interesting, and a combat system that tries something new and is challenging, which it is. We probably won't be seeing a Gotham Knights sequel, which is a shame because the game here is a solid foundation, and WB would take away lessons from this game that would give us a more refined experience with a sequel, naturally. There is still another DC project in development by WB Montreal, and I have all the confidence in the world that that will be their Guardians of the Galaxy moment. You know, a game with better written characters, no fluff, and a better understanding of what it wants to be. Not to say that Gotham Knights is the Marvel's Avengers of WB Montreal, because remember, Gotham Knights is good actually. I think.